Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and today we're going to continue our lesson on Mendelian genetics by reviewing Mendel's Law of Segregation, taking a look at test crosses, and learning about Mendel's Law of Independent Assortment and Dihybrid Crosses. And by now you know that most of your traits, from your eye color to the shape of your earlobe, are influenced by genes found on your DNA. And that DNA is organized into chromosomes that is found in the nucleus of all your cells. You also know that those genes were passed on to you by your parents. But in the 1800s, this information was not known by anyone. But that did not stop an Austrian monk experimenting with pea plants from figuring out the rules by which genes are inherited. His name was Gregor Mendel. In the previous lesson, you learned about Mendel's first law, the law of segregation which basically states that each parent has two copies of each gene and that when gametes are made by the parent, like for example when eggs and sperm are made, each gamete gets only one copy of each gene randomly. Now let's take a look at Mendel's law of segregation in light of what we know about chromosomes and meiosis. The idea that each organism has two copies of every gene, or factors as Mendel called them, one from its mother, and one from its father. This matches up with what we know about homologous chromosomes. Of course, each chromosome contains several hundred genes, but we still got only two copies of each gene contained within the homologous chromosomes, one from each parent. Mendel then stated that the factors separate from each other in the process of making gametes, eggs or sperm cells, which we know is exactly what happens during meiosis one when the homologous chromosomes separate into different cells, which then go on to complete meiosis II and form the gametes. A Punnett square can help us use the law of segregation to predict the genotypes and phenotypes of any particular cross. Let's perform a cross between two yellow-seeded plants that are both heterozygous for the trait. Now remember, heterozygous means that their genotype consists of two types of allele. In this case, a dominant allele for yellow pea seed color, and a recessive allele for green pea seed color. Also remember that we denote the dominant alleles with an uppercase letter and the recessive alleles with a lowercase letter. Now to prepare a Punnett square, all possible gametes made by the parents are written along the top and side of a grid. The combinations of egg and sperm, or in this case of ova and pollen, are then made in the boxes in the table representing fertilization and the production of different offspring. What the Punnett square does is it allows us to predict the probability of an offspring having a particular genotype and therefore a particular phenotype. So from this Punnett square, we can predict that there is a 1 in 4 chance, or 25%, that this cross will result in a homozygous dominant offspring, a 2 in 4 chance, or 50%, that it will result in a heterozygous offspring, and a 1 in 4 chance, or 25%, that it will result in a homozygous recessive offspring. These are the genotypic ratios. You can also write them as a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. We can also predict the phenotypic ratio of the offspring, what they will look like. 3 out of the 4, or 75%, have at least one copy of the dominant allele, so they will be yellow and the other 25% have only the recessive allele, so we'll have the green phenotype. Again, we can use ratios instead of percentage to denote this. Mendel also came up with a way to figure out whether an organism with a dominant phenotype had a heterozygous genotype or a homozygous dominant genotype. For example, Let's say that fur color in guinea pigs is controlled by a single gene that follows the Mendelian rules of inheritance we just learned. And let's say that there are two alleles for fur color. The black fur color variant of the gene, which is dominant, and the white fur color variant of the gene, which is recessive. So if you have a black guinea pig as a pet, let's call him Bob, you can't be sure of Bob's genotype because both the homozygous dominant and the heterozygous genotypes produce black fur. So what could you do if you really wanted to know whether Bob was homozygous or heterozygous? The technique that Mendel developed is called a test cross, and it is still used by plant and animal breeders today. 
So how does a test cross work? Well, to perform a test cross, you will need to breed your guinea pig with another guinea pig, one whose genotype you are sure of. Then you will look at the offspring and use them as clues to Bob's genotype. So let's say you take Bob to the pet store to find a mate. You don't have to bring him, but you respect him enough to make him part of the process. At the pet store, you find that there are only two female guinea pigs for sale. One with black fur and one with white fur. Which one should you pick as Bob's mate? If you pick the white guinea pig, you are thinking like a scientist. Because in a test cross, the organism with the dominant phenotype is crossed with an organism that displays a recessive phenotype and is therefore homozygous recessive. The white guinea pig has to be homozygous recessive. It is the only way for her to be white. On the other hand, the black guinea pig, cute as she might be, has an unknown genotype, just like Bob, and would not be a good choice for a test cross. So now that you have bought the perfect guinea pig for the test cross, you bring Bob, and let's call her Sarah, back to your home. You place both guinea pigs in the same cage, turn down the lights, give them some privacy, and let nature take its course. In the meantime, you prepare a Punnett square so that you can make an accurate conclusion about Bob's genotype once the babies are born. So during a test cross, if the organism with the dominant phenotype, in this case Bob, is homozygous, then all of the offspring will get a dominant allele from the parent that will be heterozygous, but will show the dominant phenotype. So all the offspring would have black fur. If, on the other hand, Bob is heterozygous for fur color, then his offspring under a test cross will be half heterozygous with black fur and half homozygous recessive with white fur. Or at least there would be a 50-50 chance or a 50% probability that they would be born with either black fur or white fur. So finally the day arrives. Bob and Sarah's babies are born. They had six babies, and one of them is white. Now it's not 50%, but that's enough to let you know that Bob must be heterozygous, because that is the only way for one of his babies to be born with white fur. Now let's talk about dihybrid crosses. When Mendel initially performed his pea plant experiments, he was investigating only one trait at a time. Mendel's law of segregation would let him predict how a single trait associated with a single gene is inherited. But later on, he wanted to predict the inheritance of two traits associated with two different genes. For example, instead of just looking at seed shape by itself and seed color by itself, he wondered if the inheritance of one trait would affect the inheritance of the second trait. To make an accurate prediction, he needed to know whether the two genes are inherited independently or not. That is, whether they ignore one another when they are sorted into gametes. For example, do the genes for seed shape either round or wrinkled, and the genes for seed color, either yellow or green, move into gametes without influencing each other? Or whether they stick together and get inherited as a unit? Like, for example, if the genes for round seeds and yellow seeds move together, and the ones for wrinkled and green seeds move together. To answer this question, Mendel perform another set of experiments, this time looking at two traits at a time. He tested the inheritance of seed shape and seed color simultaneously. From the experiments he performed, he was able to conclude that the alleles for two different genes get sorted into gametes independently of one another. In other words, the allele that a gamete received from one gene does not influence the allele received for another gene. He called this the law of independent assortment. Now let's look at a concrete example of the law of independent assortment. Imagine that we cross two pure breeding pea plants, one with yellow round seeds that is homozygous dominant for both traits, and one with green wrinkled seeds that of course is homozygous recessive for both traits. Because each parent is homozygous for both traits, the law of segregation tells us that the gametes made by the round yellow plant are all big R, big Y, and the gametes made by the wrinkled green plant are all little r, little y, because there is no other possible combination. 
That gives us offspring that are heterozygous for both traits. Because the allele for yellow seed color is dominant to the allele for green seed color, and the allele for round shape is dominant to the allele for wrinkle shape, all the plants would produce yellow and round seeds. And because they are heterozygous for two genes, the plants are called dihybrids. Di meaning two, and hybrid meaning heterozygous. So when we cross with each other, the offspring from the first cross, the ones that are heterozygous for both traits, we called it a dihybrid cross. And that's exactly what Mendel did. When he looked at the offspring of a dihybrid cross, he found that there were four different categories of pea seeds among them. Round yellow, round green, wrinkled yellow, and wrinkled green. These combinations of traits appeared in a ratio of approximately 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. This ratio, 9, 3, 3, 1, was the key clue that led Mendel to the law of independent assortment. The idea that the inheritance of one trait, like seed shape, and another trait, seed color, did not influence each other. The genes assorted themselves into gametes, independent of each other. So to prove this, we need to show the results that would be predicted by a dihybrid cross if the genes assort independently. And to do this, we need to use a much larger Punnett square than we have so far. One that can accommodate every possible combination of gametes that can be produced by each parent. One of the dihybrid pea plants could produce gametes that had every possible combination of both the seed shape and color alleles. So some of its gametes would get a big R and a big Y. Some would get a big R and a little y. Some would get a little r and a big y. And some would get a little r and a little y. And the same would be true for the other seed plant. It could have every possible combination of r's and y's within its genome. When the gametes are combined, every possible seed type is produced. When we count the number of seeds of each type that we get, for the 16 different combinations, we get 9 round and yellow seeds, 3 round and green seeds, 3 wrinkled and yellow, and 1 wrinkled green, which is the ratio that Mendel got and the reason why he concluded that genes are sort independently from each other. Now let's take a look at Mendel's law of independent assortment in light of what we know about chromosomes and meiosis. Mendel's law of independent assortment describes the formation of gametes with all possible combinations of genes. Well, it is no coincidence that the term independent assortment is used to describe the process during metaphase 1 of meiosis that increases genetic variation in gametes. When the homologous chromosomes lined up in their pairs, they can do so in ways that will produce all possible genetic combinations in the gametes that are produced. When looking at two genes at once, or two pairs of chromosomes at once, we end up with gametes with four possible genetic combinations. Furthermore, if we allocate a specific genes to chromosomes, we can see that independent assortment of the two pairs of chromosomes that contain those genes can lead to the same genetic combinations predicted by Mendel's law of independent assortment, which means that as long as the genes for two traits are found in separate chromosomes, Mendel's law of independent assortment holds true. Now, there are exceptions to Mendel's law of inheritance, something we will be exploring in the next lesson. For example, if the genes for two traits are found in the same chromosome, which can happen since a single chromosome can contain hundreds of genes, then Mendel's law of independent assortment does not apply to those traits, and we say that those traits are linked. But let's not worry about that right now. And that's it for this lesson. Next time, we will be looking at some of those exceptions to Mendel's laws. Talk to you soon.